From 1921 to 1924, Viola starred in 23 more films at Metro, maintaining her ranking as one of their chief stars. Her contract appears to have expired in 1924, just as they had merged with Goldwyn and were about to merge with Mayer to form MGM. Moving to Paramount later that year, Viola first starred opposite Adolf Maju in the hilarious comedy Open All Night as a wife driven mad by her husband's cool, calm demeanor. In 1925, Viola appears to have begun to freelance, moving between Paramount, First National, and even returning once to MGM to star in The Great Love. One of her best performances that year was in Winds of Chance, a drama that concerned a love triangle between Viola's character and the characters played by Ben Lyon and Anna Q. Nelson, all set in the California Gold Rush. This film gave her a real meaty role that she could sink her teeth into and demonstrate her considerable dramatic emotional abilities. In an interview with Photoplay that year, Viola expressed satisfaction with this film and stated that the years of playing in the comedies at Metro had frustrated her and left her wanting more chances to be a straight dramatic actress. Also in 1925, Viola married football player turned actor Lefty Flynn, a marriage that would last until 1929. Between 1926 and 1927, Viola starred in 10 films, mostly at FBO, with an occasional film at other studios such as The Ice Flood, which was made at Universal. This film was an adventure set in the Northwest at a lumber camp that allowed Viola to demonstrate her dramatic abilities again, but the film didn't seem to make much of an impression with the critics getting mixed reviews in the New York Times and Variety. Sadly, none of her other films in 1927 at FBO B.O. seemed to be big hits with her final film, Lure of the Nightclub, getting several reviews stating that it was beneath her usual quality of pictures and beneath her talents as an actress. But in 1928, Viola's career got an upswing. Having left FBO, she was cast in young director Frank Capra's comedy That Certain Thing at Columbia, which at that time was a much smaller studio. This delightful film saw Viola as Molly, a gold digger that marries a rich heir, played by Ralph Graves, for his money before actually falling in love with him, even after his father cuts off his inheritance. The film got Viola glowing reviews, particularly in Variety, who stated that she and Ralph Graves are exce exceptionally good. However, despite this film's apparent success, it was Viola's only movie that year. In 1929, she made two more final silents at Poverty Row Studios, Two Sisters and One Splendid Hour. Sadly, both of these films appear to be lost. Two Sisters would be fascinating to see because it gave Viola the opportunity to play a dual role of one good sister and one crooked sister and got her a great review in Photoplay. Towards the end of 1929, Viola was curiously invited, alongside her sister Shirley Mason, to appear in their technically second talkie debut at Warner Brothers and Show of Shows the studio's musical extravaganza that was intended to introduce the voices and musical talents of its stars to the viewing public. I say curiously because neither Shirley nor Viola were under contract at Warner Brothers, nor had they made a film there, and had each only made a few films at First National before it became part of Warner Brothers. And those films were made years before the merger. However, it happened... I'm sorry, however it happened, if you know, please let me know, Viola and Shirley joined Dolores and Helene Costello and several other sets of sisters in the fun Meet My Sister number. The Flugrass sisters were dressed as two Dutch girls and danced a Dutch clog before joining all of the sisters in the song and dance finale of the number. Despite this film being a hit and Viola and Shirley being wonderful in it, neither sister appears to have been given a Warner's contract and both pretty much retired after its release although Viola would star in two shorts in 1932 and 1933, including The Strange Case of Poison Ivy at Columbia. Several film sites have stated that Viola did not make a full transition to the talkies after the show of shows due to her voice not being suitable, but every review that I've seen that, of that film that mentioned Viola always praises her and Shirley. According to press and photoplay and motion picture news, Viola went back to headlining vaudeville in early 1930. Both Viola and Shirley appeared alongside Agnes Ayres and other stars in a 1930 picture play article about former big stars that are apparently now on Hollywood's waiting list. Several articles in all three magazines from 1930 mentioned Viola's successful vaudeville tour and several performance highlights from it. Clearly, she was still a big enough name to garner a significant amount of press as a movie star in movie magazines even though she was no longer in the movies. So why wasn't she in the movies? Maybe it was her choice. 
1930, she married for the third time to pro golfer Jimmy Thompson and appeared with him in Hollywood on parade uh, a few years later, receiving a golf lesson as the camera took a tour of stars' homes in Hollywood. Again, this was five years after she stopped making feature-length films, and she was still a big enough name to be included in a short film like this. In 1945, Viola divorced Thompson and, according to one article that I found, was working in a Los Angeles clothing store for several years to come, seemingly content to be away from the limelight. In 1956, she came out of retirement to appear in the night of January 16th, a live television play on the Lux Video Theater program. In 1963, she made her final acting appearance on an episode of My Three Sons as a blind date to Bub, played by William Frawley. Other articles I found stated that along with her work at the clothing store, which she was still doing at this point, Viola enjoyed volunteering at the Motion Picture Country Home in Los Angeles with its patients. She would eventually move there herself in 1979. In 1976, Viola was interviewed by film historians Kevin Brownlow and David Gill for their incredible Tim's TV documentary on silent film, Hollywood, which would be released in 1980. Viola told amazing stories about her debut in The Flickers, her move from New York to Hollywood, her work with Edison's Keen to Phone, and what it was like to film close-ups, her friendships with Rudolph Valentino and Buster Keaton, and she also recounted her heartbreaking experience in witnessing Ormer Locklear's death. In 1986, at the age of 89, Viola was interviewed for another documentary by film historian Anthony Slide, Vi, Portrait of a Silent Star, in which she discusses her life and work in movies and on Broadway. Check out this short documentary on YouTube, because at the age of 89, Viola is still sharp, lovely, and an incredible storyteller. A year later, in 1987, Viola Dana passed away from natural causes at the age of 90 at the Motion Picture Country Home in Los Angeles. So we are left with the question, why did Viola Dana not make the full transition to the talkies? I honestly don't know if I have an answer to this question. Earlier, I mentioned how modern film sites have stated that her voice deemed Viola unsuitable for talkie stardom, but I can't find any evidence of that and wonder if she's just another victim of that common folklore legend of silent stars couldn't make it in the talkies to their voices, along with Clara Bow, John Gilbert, Corinne Griffith, etc. Her work with Shirley Mason in Show of Shows appears to have been well-received, and let's not forget that she was stage-trained and at the age of 18 was not only a star on Broadway, but also a star of one of the first talkies ever made. A more logical explanation, in my opinion, for Viola's lack of talkie stardom in the 30s is that, first, her popularity seemed to wane, but not vanish completely, at the end of the 20s due to the quality of her films at FBO not being as high as her previous films had been at Metro which led to her probably becoming disillusioned with the industry. And then second, due to this disillusionment, Viola seemed to content to leave the industry behind. She returned to her roots on the vaudeville stage and then focused on her new marriage. However, since her name was still in all of the movie magazines for the majority of the 1930s, and she was featured in that 1934 Hollywood on Parade short, it proves that she was still popular enough to be remembered and discussed often leading me to, the, to make the conclusion that the decision to not pursue a full-time talkie career must have been hers. However, that is just my conclusion. If you have any more answers to why Viola did not achieve stardom in the talkies in the 30s, please let me know. Several of Viola's films have amazingly survived and are available to watch on YouTube. I suggest checking out Nursery Favorites, Children of Eve, Blue Jeans, Open All Night, Winds of Chance, and be sure to watch her amazing interviews in both Hollywood and by Portrait of a Silent Star. Viola Dana was a true class act and deservedly is well remembered as a huge star of the silent screen. Here's to you, Vi. Please like and subscribe or follow this account if you want to learn more about the history of silent film stars whose stardom lasted only briefly in the talkies. Up next, join me as I cover the silent talkie career of John Darrow. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful week.